pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And then my heart, that when you speak your word, Setting sail, my 
mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning and great is his faithfulness the Lord is my portion and in him I have my hope and thank you Jesus that every situation has hope in your name and you are our help in time of need oh blessed be the name of the Lord
praise God. Lift your hands towards heaven today. Father, thank you that you have never left us, nor have you ever forsaken us. Through it all, you've always watched over us. You've got our backs. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have safety in you. In everything, Lord Jesus, there's now peace in our heart and minds to know that all is well because you are in control and you are watching over each one of us. Thank you for blessing every household represented here. Thank you for what for touching every house, every family, everyone that is connected right now is in some way or another through the streaming or through the service, bless their homes. In Jesus' name, you are our peace. You're our very present help in times of trouble. You're never late. You're always faithfully with us, and we appreciate you in everything. We give thanks in Jesus' name. And if you're blessed by the Lord, say amen. Amen. Praise God. We have human beings in the house today. It is a live service on stream, and yet we have people in the house. We want to welcome everybody that's watching online. And those that are here, you can take a seat. Just greet somebody beside you to your left and right. And everybody online as well, make sure you're not distracted. Make sure that all things are well uh, as we come to the Word. Can we appreciate in tune? That's our worship ministry just for all the time and the effort. Uh, it's just a short time during the service, but the rehearsals and the practices that they put in, we want to appreciate all these people. Uh, we've told you before that at the end of a movie, there's always credits of all the people that are involved in making the movie. And in, in appreciation of that, we've got a big broadcast team, uh, production with lights and everybody uh, around us. You can't see them, but God bless your hearts for all the volunteers in City Church. Anyway, happy Father's Day. Yeah, and especially to all the first-time fathers, there's a bunch from City Church. There's a lot of babies that were born during the lockdown uh, in one and a half years, and we haven't done a baby ded dedication in a while, so we're, we're probably going to have a whole classroom of babies one of these days, and uh, when things in... in in our children's ministry comes back, we probably should double our attendance of the children. We are a very reproductive church. In Jesus' name, how obedient to the commandment of be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of those days that we've started online services, uh, excuse me, in-person services, and there's people in the house today. It's still by invitation, a very limited number, but we get ready for this. We'll be getting into different locations very soon. Uh, there will be a city church location on a Sunday morning around your place, and that's what we're working on. We probably will not be coming back to big uh, waterfront size meetings for a while, and so we want to make sure we bring church to you because you are the church. Make sure that all distractions are set aside and just come to the word, all right? I'm, amen. And happy Father's Day. And I believe that fathers should be honored every day, not just on one day. Yes. Yeah. Last week, we talked to you about Saul, who became Paul. Remember that? Well, actually, he was Saul and Paul. He just wasn't using his Paul name because he wanted to be named after the king of, first king of Israel. And Paul meant small. He didn't want to be small. And we said last week that he had a, a Jesus encounter. He and Jesus actually got to meet each other in, in some way. A bright light shone from heaven. Were you with us last week? Yeah. Okay. And make sure you catch us on YouTube as well. We're on high definition now in YouTube. There's about 50,000 subscribers already in, in just, just this short span uh, that we've come on YouTube. But anyway, Saul was on his journey. He was a persecutor of Christians. And then a light shone from heaven, knocked him off his horse. We believe he was on a horse. He was a well-to-do person. And the voice of Jesus came across, confronting him, saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asked two questions. Who are you, Lord? Remember that? And then, what do you want me to do? Can you still recall the time that you and Jesus had an encounter? Because if you haven't had an encounter with Jesus, chances are you're not a Christian. You're just a church attendee of a Christian church. 
And so uh, his life turned around. He was blinded for three days. And sometimes you and I need to be blinded in order to see. Amen. All right, we got mics on. We want to make sure we hear your amens through your muffled voices with a mask on. But uh, he now gets up and he's led into Damascus. Remember, his initial motive to go into Damascus was to arrest Christians and throw them in jail. He now goes to Damascus blind. He's led by the hand and his life turns around. When you're blind, you have a lot of time to think about your life and what have you, you have been doing. And so when he res, is restored in sight, his whole life changes direction. And I think that should happen to every person who has an encounter with Jesus. Your life has to change direction. You don't live the same after you have an encounter. And so the person who hated Christians the most is now being hated by people who hate Christians as well. Now he shifts allegiance from being a persecutor of Christians to now being the most persecuted Christian. And his life turns around just like that. And I pray your life made a turnaround. How different are you from before you became a Christian? And we said last week that this was what's important, that most of us have a plan and ask God to bless our plan. Do you have a plan? Okay, most of us have a plan, hopefully. Some of you don't have a plan, you poor thing. But if you have a plan, most of the time we're saying, Lord, would you bless my plan? Some people plan to get married. Some people plan to have children. Some people do plan to go abroad. Some people plan to start a business. But they're planning something and they're saying, God, would you bless my plan? When actually it's the other way around. God has a plan for you that is already blessed. And if you could find out what that plan that God has for you is, then you wouldn't even have to pray that, God, would you bless my plan? It is blessed because it's God's plan. Amen. And so we've got it all bali. We've got it back to front. We've got it upside down. We're asking God to bless our plans when God has a plan that is already blessed. And so today I want to talk about that, an upside down world. We've got it. Bali, back to front, upside down. Acts chapter 17. Would you believe I'm the only person in the house with a Bible today? Amazing. Uh, maybe. Acts chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 1. It's nice to have human beings around. Now we can tease you. We can play with you. We can irritate you. Verse 1, and when they had passed through Amphipolis, come on, somebody say Amphipolis, sounds, sounds like antibiotic, sounds like medicine. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And in verse 2, Paul, as his custom was, went to them and for three Sabbaths, Sabado, three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace in Carbon, and gathered a mob, set the whole city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So, when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Father, take your word, which is already anointed by you, to speak life into all the listeners 
and arrest every distraction in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, amen. We're talking about an upside down world today. Paul was going, Saul was in a direction in life and encounters Jesus and his whole life turns around. What was upside down is now right, right side up. Who he used to be, he no longer was. And the whole life and direction and, and, and purpose of Paul or Saul changed. And the verse six is what I'm, verse six is what I'm bringing out here. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out, these who have turned the world upside down. Who are the ones who turned the world upside down? Christians. You and I are the ones supposed to turn the world upside down for them. In fact, the world is upside down. We want to flip it around to make it right side up. When Paul became a Christian, everything about his life changed. His whole world was turned upside down. Well, actually, as sinners, our world, world is upside down. When Jesus comes into our lives, he flips us right side up. Come on. He flips us right side up. But the, to the rest of the people, we're the ones upside down. But in reality, we're right side up. Does that make sense? Everything changes. His priorities change. His plans changed. His purpose changed. Now pray that as you had an, an encounter with Jesus, your life got flipped over as well. Paul's friends changed, who were once his friends became his enemies, and who were once his enemies became his friends. His faith changed, his future changed. He now had a whole belief system that was thrown out or added to that who the real Messiah was. Not only did his world change, Saul began to change the world of others. And that's what's important, that, that you can't just say, ever since I met Jesus, my life has changed. And most of the time, we just think of the sin habits that we got rid of, or, or what we used to do, we're not doing anymore. But for a Christian to be changed, it's your entire perspective and purpose and direction in life should change. And if you really believe what you believe, you will now go on a mission to change other people. Has your life really changed ever since you had an encounter with Jesus? Can you actually say, I used to be this, but now I'm like this? Come on. If you're watching this online, and if you're here in the room today, I presume you're a Christian. Why else would you be watching a Christian message? If you're watching this, and I presume you're a Christian, the question I want to ask you now is, how much has your world changed since you became a Christian? Seriously. I don't mean you just, I changed church. I went from that church to this church. I went from this religion to this religion. Not just that, but how much have you really changed? Because they, they were so changed, and wherever they went, people were saying, these people turn your world upside down. And so we've got, let's get that clear. Actually, the world is upside down. Sin made the world upside down. Amen? And upside down means what was right is now wrong and what is wrong is now right. In fact, if you go right back to Genesis, the very presentation of the serpent to Eve was, did God really say that you can't eat of this fruit? Did God really say eating this fruit is wrong? Yes, of course. But the serpent says, no, you know what? Eating the fruit is not wrong. It's all right. You won't die. God said you'll die, but you'll live. And so what did the serpent present? He presented an option wherein this is what God is saying, and the serpent saying, you know what? It's the other way around. He's saying the very opposite. When did the upside down world begin? As soon as sin came into the, into the world, the world began to be turned upside down. In fact, here's a bunch of verses I want you to look at of just how things are so upside down now that you're a Christian. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To the world, this message, the Bible, they look at this and say, that's foolish. 
There's so many things that the world can say, you know what, <laughs> you guys are so opposite from who we are. And he said that the message of the cross is foolishness, but to a Christian, it's wisdom. Come on. Yeah, it's the power of God to save us when you put your faith in the word of God. But there's so many things in the Bible that if you were to tell the world this is right, they're going to say, no, you guys are wrong. From the very first sin we're in, uh, it was challenged that you will not die if you eat the fruit. And what was presented is you will live even if you eat the fruit. So go eat. Every generation after that has had a progressive upside downness happening to it till this very day. Just take your age, for example, right now and go back 10 years. Deduct 10 years from your age and think of this. If you're 40, that means you're going 30. If you would compare who you were at 30 10 years ago and those who are 30 today, there's a lot of change that's happened. A lot of things have happened from in the last 10 years. In other words, there's a progressive turning upside down of the world until it's so upside down that when the Antichrist comes, people will say that's the Christ. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. Look how upside down this is. Matthew chapter 23. Give me some time because I've got a Bible. Verse 11, Jesus says, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. In another passage of scripture, he says that the lords of this world, you know, they're, they're above other people. But in the kingdom of God, it says it's the other way around. That actually there are really two worlds, this world and God's world, and they're upside down of each other. And then he says, the greatest among you shall be the servant where do you find that in the world? In the world, the greatest step on their servants, but in God's world, it's upside down. It's right side up. In God's world, it's the servant who's considered the greatest. And the one who's trying to, it goes on, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And humility is not something that the world likes to look at and say, that's great. They like to see, if you want to be great, you have to come above other people. And Jesus is saying, no, in my world, it's upside down from yours. If you want to be great, you have to serve everybody. Isn't it true that in this world, if you lack, you take? But in God's world, when you lack, you give. Come on, Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. The passage actually in verse 1 starts out, there was a famine in the land. But in Genesis 26 verse 12, then Isaac sowed in the land. And when did he sow? He sowed during a famine. Isaac sowed in the land and he reaped that same year a hundredfold and God blessed him. How unusual is that? Because in the world, if there's a famine, you don't plant. You hold on to what you have so that you can still eat. As a Christian... The harder the times are, come on, there's been a lockdown, there's been a pandemic that's still running, and what people are saying, times are hard, businesses are hard, so what's everybody doing? They're holding back, but Christians don't do that. In hard times, Christians sow more. Isaac sowed in the time of famine, and in the same year, reaped a hundredfold, and God blessed him. And if you read on with that, God keeps blessing him. And I want to say this. That in City Church, during this pandemic and lockdown, we've given more than, we, than we've ever given. Because that's what Christians do. We're upside down from the world. Everybody's holding on to their money. We're releasing money to others. And guess what? God is blessing City Church. Not only are we giving to others, City Church people are such givers. Well, there's five in this room that say amen, but City Church people are givers. Not only are we the people givers, the church itself tithes the tithe. In other words, we'll take 10% and say, this is not for our consumption. It's to bless other people with. And that's why when you tithe, how many of you believe in the tithe? When you tithe, God will rebuke the devourer. God will rebuke the enemy. 
How many of you know God can rebuke the enemy better than you and I can? Yeah. And he'll open windows of heaven and pour out such bless blessing that your barns can't contain it. Now, that passage of scripture to a person in the world is upside down. That's foolishness that nine tenths is better than ten tenths. Because in the world, ten tenths is better than nine tenths. But in God's world, nine tenths is a lot better than ten tenths. You'll have more with nine tenths than you will with ten tenths or the whole thing. And that's because that's just God's world is just so different. Matthew chapter 5 verse 10, among the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Now, how many, how many of you know in the world when you're persecuted, you don't consider yourself blessed? But Jesus said, when you are persecuted for my sake, he said, you are blessed. And blessed actually is translated happy. Some people persecuting for you for, because of you believe in Jesus, you, you're blessed by that. You're happy. Hey, they, they hate me because I love Jesus. Oh, okay. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. It gets a lot more sticky when we're talking about how upside down the world is. Matthew 5, verse 39 is one of the hardest verses for me to obey. Thank God you're not like me. I tell you, Jesus says, not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. That is so upside down. Because logically in this world, whoever slaps you, flying kick him. All right? you, you don't slap him back. You do more than he does to you. But this is so real to me because if there's something that God has been harassing me with from the time I had an encounter and he changed my life is, Joe, don't hit back. Now, how many of you have ever hit back? Oh, look at all the self-righteous people in the house. How many of you have ever hit back? How many of you have ever felt good hitting back? How many of you have decided it feels better to hit back than to be hit? Come on. But in God's world, it's upside down. Get hit. And if you get hit, offer the other cheek. If I get hit, it's either I don't hit back or I run away. But for me to offer the other cheek will have to be very Christ-like about us. It will take anointing for you and me, the power of God for you and me to not hit back and to offer the other cheek. Whoever stones you is another verse. Where I'm not pulling it out, but you know this. Whoever stones you, Jesus said, give him, come on, bread. And every Cebuano is thinking, Elorde, that's the toughest bread. No, we're thinking, you know, if whoever stones you, give him bread. That is so upside down. And so Christians try to squirm out of that. I gave him bread, but I put it in a bottle. bread. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, this is tough. This is how upside down this world is compared to God's world. He says, love your enemies. When was the last time you loved an enemy? Now, how many of you know when an, somebody hates you, when an enemy hates you, you kind of like to hate them back? You've never hated back? He says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, I have prayed for people that have spitefully used me. But my kind of prayer was, Lord, open the ground, consume them with fire or something. You know, it's, it's always been a vengeance sort of thing. But it's never been like Jesus because it's just upside down. The logic of this world is opposite of the wisdom of God. And it's an upside down world for them. Matthew chapter 18 is one of the toughest in verse 21 and 22. One of the toughest verses that is so upside down. Peter asks, Lord, how often shall my brother who sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Seven times? Now, how many of you know if somebody offended you seven times, that's a lot. Or maybe you have offended somebody seven times, that's a lot. 
In fact, you and I have offended God more than seven times. And he's forgiven us each time. Jesus says, forgive him 70 times seven. Meaning to say, every time your brother does the same thing against you, keep forgiving him. That's upside down. Who does that? Jesus does. And you and I claim to be followers of Jesus. And a question that we want to throw back at ourselves is, how many times can you keep forgiving somebody till you've decided, last na to, last. Have you ever forgiven somebody but in the back of your mind concluded your mercy and just said, the next time he does that, bantay lang na siya. Come on. Nobody. Just me. Jesus even goes on to say, he who seeks his life shall lose it. That's upside down. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. In this world, it's me first. In God's world, God first. Then others and me last. There's a lot of books that are going out today that are actually teaching millennials to actually look, fix yourself up first, prosper first, prioritize yourself first so that you can help other people. Logical? Pretty logical. But that's not the way the world of God works. In His world, no. You put God first and all these things shall be added unto you. You put others first and God will bless you. And that is so contrary. There are people that are actually going around believing that I have to fix myself up first and amazingly, you know what? I can help others now. Now, if you've tried to ever fix yourself, you realize how impossible that really is. Have you ever tried breaking your own habit? It's one of the hardest thing to do is to just break your own habit. You help other people break their habits, God will take care of your habits. That's just how the kingdom works. That if you sow into others' lives, it'll come back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And the next thing you know, well, my habit's broken when I was helping others break their habits. In fact, some of us have become so dried up in the spirit. Ever been dry in the spirit? Okay, not you, the one beside you has been dry in the spirit. The one in front of you has been dry in the spirit. But the moment you are dry in the spirit and you try to counsel and lift somebody up, and they get so blessed by you lifting them up, guess what? You get lifted up. Because the lifting up anointing of another person passes through you. And that's what happens is when you're lifting others up, the next thing you know, they're crying and you're crying. And you go home, you say, hey, that backslider... He's not backsliding anymore. And guess what? I'm not backsliding either. Somehow that same anointing lifts you up. And when we put others first, God takes care of us. But to do that will take faith. Amen. Denying yourself. Saul had such an encounter with God that God flipped his world upside down. And now he was seeing the world in, an, in, in a per perspective that he'd never seen before things were now so upside down from what he used to do that the people he used to hate he now loved and the people he used to work with he now was against his world turned upside down and if you become a Christian or say you're a Christian but all your worldly friends are still like your best friends if you still resonate and like to do things together and laugh at the same dirty jokes and you still are with them in everything, you have not had your world uh, turned upside down yet. We're talking about a world upside down. So some characteristics of early Christians that we might need to look at. Book of Acts. Number one, early Christians, and so should we be, opposite. It's just opposite of who you were and you're opposite of what the world is. Here's a question. How opposite are you to your old you? When you look at your old you, can you actually say, I used to be like that, but now I'm like this. And I'm not just talking about vices you've given up, which you and I probably have not. But how opposite are your attitudes? How opposite is your outlook from your old you? Have you ever as a Christian now, after several years, ever met people that you used to love hanging out with and kind of find yourself out of place? Or do you go back to your old, old friends before in the other world and you kind of like saying, well, I really miss hanging out with you guys. High school reunions. 
Uh, we've probably got some of my classmates watching this, but I don't enjoy high school reunions because I'm not a high schooler anymore. And every time we have high school reunions, everybody's behaving like they're 16 again. And, and the way we tease and joke and, and with one another, we're, everybody's trying to show off that they're richer than everybody else. And that's why nobody really likes to attend high school reunions unless they have a lot of money. But if you still like your old friends, you haven't had your world turned upside down enough. Amen. Number two, not only were Christians now opposite of who they used to be, they're also opposed to who they used to be. They're actually not just, oh, I don't do that anymore. They're actually against what they used to do. Saul used to persecute Christians, and now he was totally against that. And the ones persecuting him, he was against his persecutors. And the Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take the kingdom by force. In other words, if you want to grow as a Christian, there's going to have to be a fight. First of all, you've got to win the fight on the inside. And that's one of the toughest things to do. Fight, the fight on the inside will take the anointing of God and the wisdom of God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit working together. And you will need help with other people. That's why it's good to be part of a group. Because when everybody else is against you and you're the only one, yeah, I know Jesus is with you. He'll never leave you. But it's great to have other Christians stand with you so that you can lift, be lifted up as well. I think a lot of Christians don't oppose. I think they just sit back and avoid the conflict and say, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I, I just keep quiet and avoid these people. You know what Saul did in the passage we read in Acts 17? He went into the synagogue and for three Sabbaths, he opened the scriptures and talked about Jesus. He didn't just leave his old church. He went back to his old church and say, guys, this is how it should really be. He was opposing what was the status quo. Ask yourself today, how aggressive is the Christian church against what is happening around it? Now, we, we hear things like, you know what, uh, there's child sex trafficking. Oh, the poor kids. What are they doing? And what most Christians will say is, we're going to pray against that. And prayer is one good thing, but you've got to put action to prayer. And a lot of Christians are too passive to oppose what they believe. In your own workplace and among your friends, when things are happening and it's just contrary to your world, do you just back off or can you actually speak up? I love it when people tag their friends on our Facebook when, when we stream and you've got all your friends' names there. You're specifically calling people out. I dare every one of you that are watching today to specifically tag a friend and say, you know what, you need to watch this. In fact, when was the last time you actually told somebody that you're a Christian? And there's a lot of secret Christians walking around because they know if they, they, they're discovered to be a Christian, first of all, maybe their life isn't credible enough to be called a Christian. Maybe they still want to play the games of the world. Maybe people say, ah, diha katik simba, nganong musugal pamangka or something. And their credibility of their testimony is lost. So instead of confronting and opposing, they keep quiet and just avoid the conflict. Not only did they, were they opposite, they also opposed. But thirdly, they overcame. They didn't quit. That person that you're trying to influence to be with the Lord, God changed Saul's world. Now he was changing other people's world. And he would keep doing that till things are changed. This passage in Acts 17, he met for three Sabbaths. That's like two weeks or three weeks. He met with the church, and guess what happened after he left? Because they were, they were about to stone him. They were looking for him. They went into Jason's house, couldn't find him, so they pulled out Jason. Who's Jason? I don't know, somebody in Acts 17. Paul stayed in Jason's house, but they had already pulled Paul and Silas out. Get out of here. They're going to kill you. And guess what happened after that? He went out, left Thessalonica, left that place. And guess what was born after he left? This Thessalonian church. Three weeks, a church was born. That would probably take us three years. But that's how he was. He made such a difference wherever he, he went that when he would go into a town, the whole town would be turned upside down because these people have come and preached against what we believe. We're on a lockdown. 
We're talking about an upside down world. We're asking you whether you're a Christian trying to still live your old upside down ways or have you decided to flip things right side up? Are there things that you and I have thrown out of our lives? Are there people that we're, we don't hang out with like we used to? And if you look at that with a lockdown, I've met with a lot of pastors. In fact, I with, was with some pastors this week and all of them echo the same thing. Oh, it's such hard times. Uh, church is drying up. You know, nobody's excited anymore. Nobody's coming and nobody's giving. But I want to present to you today, especially you that are watching online, you are a part of something that's growing. City Church is actually growing through the lockdown. We started, what, YouTube with what, something like 3,000 subscribers and now we're 49,500 or something. Every day there's about 100 or 200 that keep subscribing to this place. That means to say there's more and more people that we are touching than when we used to meet at the waterfront. That means you're fired up. You're not using the lockdown and not coming to church as an excuse to be weak. That we're all dried and backslidden because we don't meet anymore. No, you have a personal relationship with Jesus. I want to say this, that City Church is growing through the lockdown. And our partner ministries like Christ for Asia, they just opened a branch. They just opened a new office. They're expanding during the lockdown. And the leader of that guy here, he's a, he's a new father. He just found out the other day. Whoa. One good-looking kid's going to get born nine months from now. Glory Reborn, another partner ministry that we had that had birthed 5,000 babies in Cebu already. They're, they just opened a lab the other month. And they're believing for a hospital. They're expanding and they're growing. They're swimming against the flow. That's why this church began. We started this church 15, 16 years ago and said, if, if the church is going this way, how come the city's like this? So we decided we're going to do things that church doesn't always normally do. And that's why we got unusual people to gather in this church. That's you. This is a church of, of people who don't like church anymore. But want to give it one more shot. In fact, this is a church of people... The churches you left don't like you. And you found a place where, hey, I can be liked here. I, I found a place where all the weird, weird people in our city gather. Because in this church, we don't like gossiping. And in most churches, there's a lot of gossip going on. And you are probably the product of gossip. That's why you maybe left. Found a church that didn't gossip. You are weird. You're upside down from others. Well, you, actually, you're right side up. You're quiet, but you're weird. And today, the church is still growing. And this is something I don't know if I should say, but I'm going to say it. You are such givers in this church that when we were meeting by the thousands in Waterfront, we're actually giving more today during lockdown than when we were meeting as a big group. That is unusual. That's upside down. All the pastors and people I'm meeting, it says everything's shrinking. And we're saying, no, everything's growing. Amen. You've lost your voice, but everything's growing. And today, with a lockdown, perfect excuse not to serve. You've got the most legitimate excuse not to serve. What well, Pakuma vaccinated, you know, or something. That's a great excuse. Or... Kuya, uh, we don't want to go out. We might get exposed. You know, we don't want to go and do church because we might get exposed. But we see them going out everywhere. That's why it's an excuse not to serve. But city church people don't use that excuse. We've been waiting to serve. It's great to see people behind the cameras. Normally, the cameras aren't manned by anybody. Today, there are human beings behind the cameras. And usually, it's just empty seats. I'm talking to an empty room. But now there's people. Oh, their batteries are on. I thought it was just decoration, but they're alive. It's also a perfect excuse not to give. This is a great time to say, how can we give? First of all, a lot of Christians don't give, number one. They don't know how to give online. But City Church people, you're techie people. You know how to give online. Oh, come on. You, Lazada and Shopee is just, you're used to that. And now you're just 
decided, oh, you know, I, I, we've actually started giving online better. And I asked somebody, can you give us a theory why you think our giving grew online in services like this than when we were actually meeting? And one, one businessman actually said, you know what? It's actually harder to pull literal, real money out of your wallet than to write a check. And then he said, it's easier to press a few buttons than write a check out. It's so easy to just add one more zero before the decimal point. And it doesn't hurt as much as when you actually see Mabini and Aquino leave your hand. Real Christians are still serving. Real Christians are still tagging their friends. Real Christians are t- still telling people, you know what? We love the Lord. We love church. You should join what we're doing. And of course, you can tag them by doing that. The easiest way to reach out to people, you don't have to leave your house, talk to them. You can just tap their name into it and they're connected already. And City Church is still serving. City Church is still giving because you are opposite of the world. You have had your world turned right side up. While others compromise, you're still committed. While others are lazy with apathy, you're hungry to serve, tag your friends. While others are paralyzed in fear, you're walking in the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And how many of you know it's important to have a sound mind? Early Christians, bring this to a close, early Christians had raw faith. The whole world was against them, but they just had faith to believe. They had radical commitment. Rated our church raw and radical. And they resisted the world, submitted to God, resisted the devil. And fourthly, they had righteousness in the midst of sin. In fact, if you and I say we're Christians, we're Christians, sin bothers us. Now, do you, do you still sin? Excuse me. Are you like me? I still sin. Do you sin too? But you know what? Can you agree sin bothers us? Sin bothers you? Every time you hear a song of worship, it just bothers you already that you're sinning. And God, forgive me 70 times, 69 times 7, and Lord, please forgive me again. And Jesus said, okay, I'll forgive you if you'll do the same forgiving to others. We'll close with this. We said before, what if you went into a store at night and you were allowed to change all the price tags of all the items inside that store? You can take a TV that was worth 90,000 pesos and sell it, put a price of a Hershey's bar on it. You could switch everything around if you'd want to. And people would come in and what was cheap was now expensive and what was expensive is now cheap. It's got flipped around. When you think about that, that's what the devil really did. The devil really flipped the world and changed the price tags. He put the price of virginity and said, that's cheap. Just give it away. And it's flipped. Two generations ago, that was still valued. Another generation passed. It wasn't valued so much today. It's not valued at all. It's even mocked. But the value of virginity is gone. Two decades ago, people didn't really live in. Well, they they were, but it was like a stigma against society. But now the world is so flipped upside down, you can just call them, this is my partner, and not have any awkwardness with it. And you might be listening to that and say, well, you're pretty old-fashioned. No, we're just right side up. That's still upside down. And every five, ten years, every generation that passes, there's a flipping, a progressive turning upside down of things that what was right is now wrong and what is wrong is now right. Started with Eve in the garden and it's still going on today. Don't get so used to something that is turned upside down and say, that's normal, that's the way it should be. When people can sell children for sexual, to be sexually abused for money, that parent has his world upside down. When things are so flipped that going to church is crazy, that being a Christian and believing in Christ is crazy, then the world is so flipped and upside down. And that's what we have to always remember. The world is upside down. When Jesus came into our lives, He flipped it right side up. It was so symbolic that when He went into the temple, He saw 
money changers with tables and he flipped the tables upside down. He said, my father's house shouldn't be a business. My father's house should be a house of prayer. And he flipped the tables upside down or really he flipped the tables right side up. He was telling the church, you got everything upside down. If a church is in operation because it's a business, then that church has got things flipped upside down. And that's why we don't, we don't do that in City Church. We're not after money. And yet, because we're not after money, God blesses the church with it so we can bless others. When was the last time you actually heard an offering message in City Church? In the last 16 years, we have never had a sermon dedicated to offerings or giving. It's always just been understood that if you love God, you will give. But we've never searched the archives. There's not been one sermon where we dedicated just to giving. And then had a second offering. We have never had a second offering in City Church. Nor have we ever had a special offering. A a dedicated offering for something. When we built the new center. And this is the third one already. We never actually had. You know what guys? We're building a new center. You might want to drop a little bit of extra into the offering bag. We've never done that. And because money was not the central motive of what we're doing, God blessed us with it. Because you either love God or you love money. And the love of money can be a root of all evil. Who changed the price tags? The devil did. And now the devil doesn't have to do it anymore. The world's doing it. But the church should never participate in the changing of the price tags of things. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so the question we end you off with was, how much have you changed? How much has your world been flipped right side up ever since Jesus came into your life? How bali are you from what you used to be? How different are you today? Do you still surprise yourself to say, man, the old me would have done this entirely different. Oh, it's so good to have a real keyboardist beside me as we bring this to a close it's a human being when normally it's just a pre-recorded song how alive celebrate worship celebrate yourselves coming together and that's why when the lockdown came it was so awkward for us not to gather in worship anymore because we've gotten so used to the right side up of what Sunday should be And now we're trying to bring that all back. I pray today, wherever you are, that your world gets flipped right side up. Because the world outside, it's really upside down. Read the news. All the nations are in unrest. It's all about control. Who controls the money? Who controls the sea lanes? Who controls the oil? Who controls this? Who controls that? Politics is all about who controls. But you know what Jesus says? You want to be great? You be the servant. You want to have? Give. You want to live in peace? Forgive others. Love your enemies. You're a Christian? You're weird. You know why? You don't belong to this world. You belong to His world. But you're still here. Don't compromise with it. Change the world around you. In Jesus' name, that's what Paul did. He would change the world around him. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your goodness is forever. You are so different, Lord, that in other religions, people bring a sacrifice to their gods. But with you, you gave the sacrifice so that there could be reconciliation. You gave Jesus to forgive us of all sin. And we thank you for that. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are so different and opposite from the world. And you've called us to be that different. I am different and I celebrate it that I am not like the world around me. I am not conformed to the standards of this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I pray people challenged today are challenged today and would flip their worlds right side up for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we got a tribute to fathers. Happy Father's Day, everyone around the world watching. 
And I pray tomorrow will be Happy Father's Day as well. And every day will be Happy Father's Day. But because we're in Cebu, today's Happy Father's Day. Tomorrow onwards is always Mother's Day for the rest of the year. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Father's Day. God bless you all and see you next week.